Miles Wally Albright, August 22nd, 2022. Bible in a Bar. Hobbs Island Pit Stop. Hobbs Island Road. Huntsville, Alabama. Jesus, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help us. Help me to lay a foundation to build a frame around Christ. To help us understand the Word of God. Help us to understand and to teach others and to become teachers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, okay, tonight um, I recently started another class, and I realized for that class uh, they did, I had to lay a foundation for them so they could understand some stuff. And it's been a long time since for this group I have laid this foundation. As a matter of fact, well, I'm, I'm sure I have, but I'm not sure I'd have, have this recorded. But this is um, really how patriarchal Genesis starts. And Genesis is the key to understanding the rest of the Bible, you think. It's the beginning. Um, and there's some, some things here that are very instructive for daily life. This is about generational issues. It's profoundly deep. Um, it's profoundly important to understand the whole rest of the scripture. The way they began in with, with Abraham and what Abraham did or Abram did cast its shadow across certainly his son and grandson and great-grandsons, the 12 tribes of Israel. But that defines how Exodus will play out and how the rest of the Old Testament, building a frame up to Christ, even the timing of the coming of Christ had to do with the decisions of Abram, in my opinion. In the fullness of times, God sent forth his son. When times were full to the brim, to the edge, when they were stretched, and a lot of that time, timing, had to do with this. Had to do with what Abram did in the very first verses. But some, there's something that's very instructive. Abram begins, so to speak, in Genesis 12. But Genesis 11 tells us some really important things that I want to say and <clears throat> lay a foundation and make some of the other stuff that I've taught make sense. So what I want to do is look at the very last part of 11, chapter 12, and chapter 13. 12 is not very long. It's about 20 verses. Uh, 13 is 18 verses. So <clears throat> that's really not that, that much. But I need to lay this. It's really good for me. I mean, I will eat, drink, and drink, sleep this stuff, but it's good for me to go back and lay this out again. Okay, chapter 11 of Genesis, because the Word of God is infinite. There's, there's No matter how much you've been in it, you can learn from the same verses again. Genesis 11, verse 27, this is the account of Terah. I have a good friend named Tara, <laughs> but this is, a, you know, it's a great, beautiful name, but wouldn't you hate to be a kid and everybody said you were a Tara? <laughs> okay. Anyway, I don't know if this guy was a Tara or not, but um, he had a grandson whose name was meaningful. Okay. This is the account of Tara in English. His grandson's name is meaningful in English, it seems, as we'll get to that. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Okay, Terah, Abram, 
Haran Nahor. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans. That's where the Babylonians are, Babylon, but will be Babylon someday. In the land of his birth, Haran. We don't know what happened to Haran, but we do know he died as an adult because he had already become the father of Lot. As an adult, he died. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no children. We find out later, Sarai is also the daughter of Terah uh, by a different wife. Terah had at least two wives. Uh, one of them was the mother of Abram, but he had another one wife that was the mother of Sarai. So she's the half-sister of her husband, Abram. Terah took his son, Abram, his grandson, Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, the wife of his son, Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Okay, stop right there. So Terah's in charge. It says he takes them. He's leading. It's him that's calling the shots, making the decisions. Terah is the patriarch. But when they came to Haran, a city that happens to be named after the dead son, they settled there. Okay, so there's half measures here. It's clear that Terah was supposed to go to Canaan and was going to go to Canaan and changed his mind because he didn't die here. He lived quite a while after this. But he got to a place that was named after his son. It may have been named after his son that died after he got there. There's nothing harder than the death of a child, even an adult child, maybe especially adult child, is the hardest thing a person can experience in life, I believe. And so he's lost his son. Tara's lost his son. He gets to this place. It's named after that son. He knows he's supposed to go into Canaan, but he goes half measures and he stops. If he was supposed to go to Canaan, he was being called there by God. And the purpose in going to Canaan is to get away from the idolatry that they were in, in Ur of the Chaldeans. They were worshiping the moon gods. Uh, they're not far from where they were worshiping Dagon at some point in time. It's really a hideous thing. And we say that it's hideous and we really don't really get how demonic, how evil, how bloody and perverted and ugly demonic worship can be. It's not just like a, a different denomination. It's hideous. And God is all about first order of business to leave that behind them. It's going to be a big deal for Abraham when he's talking uh, about the future of his son, that his son, Isaac, never, ever, ever goes back down there because he knows if he does, <clears throat> there will be a hook. There will be a hook of that idolatry. And to be in the perfect will of God in my understanding, it's kind of like a three dimensions, okay? You got to be in the right place at the right time with the right people. And not with the wrong people, not in the wrong place, and not in the wrong time. And so there's this foundation that's being laid here. And Terah had the opportunity to be the first patriarch in Canaan. <clears throat> and he left it. And he may have left it because of grief. We don't know. He may have left it because of grief. And in my, in my opinion, the hardest test is always family. The hardest test is always family. In my own experience, in my observation as I've lived, but also in the Bible, the toughest test is those you love. 
Jesus said some really strong things about family and following Jesus. You know, family is the most precious gift he's given us on the earth, but they can be a hindrance to becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's very, very, very clear in the New Testament. So, chapter 12, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. <clears throat> so there's a point there where Abram was the one that was starting to hear this call, and he got the call, the destiny, the anointing that was supposed to be his father's, and his father's, his father left it. He laid it down, and it passed down to Abram, and Abram started hearing God say, leave, leave, leave. Leave three things, your country, your people, and your family specifically. You'd think it might be enough to just say people, but no, he narrows it down to, to uh, family also, specifically. And then fourth thing, go to the place that I've called you. And the promise that came was, I'll make you a great nation, and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I'll curse. And all the peoples on earth, wow, all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's a promise of the Messiah. It's a promise that the Messiah will come out of your bloodline. I'm going to begin a family. I'm going to begin a nation. I'm going to begin a people. And those people will spread out and bless all the other nations. Eventually, he's going to establish the Jewish nation, Israel. And they're going to have a covenant. And they're going to have prophets. And they're going to have history. And finally, in the fullness of time, the Messiah will come out of that. And that will be the context for Messiah. And it has to, there has to be a context. There's nothing as great as the coming of Yahweh as Messiah on the earth. And so God's not going to hurry. And he's not going to do half measures. And he's not going to do cheap. He's going to go to every length to establish a wonderful frame for the awesome picture that is Messiah. So that men are without excuse. All of all the background of Messiah, the prophecies, the history, the law, the Torah, the prophets, all of this will really glorify the one who is to come. So all this really is about Messiah. God is not ever in a hurry. Eternity is no big deal to him. Certainly a few thousand years is no big deal to God. One day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. He's going to do it right for his son. So Abram left as the Lord had told him. Now he did that right. The Lord told him to leave. That was the fourth thing. And leave. And go to where I'm telling him. He left as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Okay. Like I said, that's a good pun in English. This grandson of Terah, who hopefully wasn't a Terah to his family. But Lot was a Lot, because Lot was family, and taking Lot or letting Lot be with him, it's going to say Lot went, so it's like it's Lot's choice, but also it's going to say Abram took him. But there's a there's a dual thing here. Abraham, again, fails with regard to family. It could be that Terah failed because he was bereaved and he got weak and, and he just did not fulfill the call in his life and it passed down to his son, Abram. Abram then is called to do four things, one, two, three, four, and he misses number three. He doesn't do number three. He does not leave family and Lot went with him. Lot was a lot. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot. So he's taking her, him just like he took her. So he has authority. He's making this decision. And all the possessions they, that's both, Lot and Abram, had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. They set out, and they arrived. Okay, get this. Abram... doesn't know God very much yet. He's heard this voice, and God is, has to begin somewhere, 
and he begins with this guy who has been a moon worshiper. He's 75 years old. That's even older than me, okay? <laughs> He's even older than me when he started, and he heard the voice of God. Now think about this. He gets four words. They're not written in a Bible. There is no Bible. He gets four words. It's a voice, an audible voice, or it's in his head. He's hearing the voice of God in his head, or the Lord is literally standing before him. That happened several times with him. The Lord Jesus manifested in a Christophany and talked to Abram face to face. In fact, ate lunch with him one day. Okay. Probably, I think it was that for him to do all this. I think the Lord Jesus appeared in a tangible physical form and said, I'm calling you to do something special. And he gave him four orders and he only obeyed three. He disobeyed number three. Mm -mm. And Lot was a lot. Because of the nature of God being love, and the nature of love requiring free will, he is not going to say, God is not going to say, eh, I told you not to bring Lot. It's just not how he's operating. If he had, he would have changed the nature of love, the nature of who God is, the nature of how he relates to his children. Abram is becoming his child. He's already told him, but he's treating him like an adult child. And he's treating him like, okay, I'm telling you what to do. If you don't obey, obey me, I'm not going to appear again as a ball of fire and say, did you hear what I said about family? Think about that. That's how demons work. Is they force you. They threaten you. But here, especially in the early days, as God is defining who he is, it is the love and the wisdom and the beauty of God that he did not rebuke immediately Abram for carrying Lot. It's deep, but think about that. But he is God, and he has more than one option. And so there will be consequences. There will be immediate consequences for this disobedience. Think about this. And as we get through with our story here, we're going to see that Abram will eventually repent of bringing Lot. But we're going to see, you know, when he does that, it's going to make things a lot, 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 lot better when he doesn't have a lot. But at the same time, there are cascading downstream consequences for having brought Lot. The grace of God is huge. And when he gets rid of Lot, the grace of God will be there for Abram to be able to not drop the ball like his father did. Abram almost dropped the ball like Terah did. We're going to see that. But it, it took a lot, but he got rid of Lot. But still, there are going to be consequences. It's part of the wisdom, power, and love of God that there will be consequences. It's part of the wisdom, love, and power of God that he can, that Abram can repent, see what God is doing without God threatening him, and get rid of Lot. It's a beautiful story, really. Okay. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah in, at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and Yahweh, Lord, the Lord, appeared to Abram and said to him, in English this says, to your offspring I will give this land. Eight words in English, a lot less in Hebrew. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. If, if you think about it, there's something ominous about this. He could have said that to Terah. When Terah disobeys and doesn't go to Canaan when he's supposed to, God can say, well, 
to your offspring. And he, he knows everything, but it's like he could say, to your offspring, I don't know how far down, but he knows. But somewhere in your offspring, I can, I'm going to give this land. He could have said that here because he didn't obey and go on and change his geography. Abram didn't obey and leave family. And he's not saying, I'm going to give you this land and your offspring. He's just saying, I will give it to your offspring. There is a limited partial obedience here. And Abram is about to go through a test, a pressure. And in this, he will see the word of the Lord. And he will ultimately repent of bringing Lot. And that's, that's the, really the foundation of the rest of the Bible. And I'm going to show you that as we go along. From there, he went toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. I think he called on the name of the Lord because there was a famine in the land. And I think he called on the Lord and he didn't hear anything. He had heard, I'm going to give this land to your offspring, and that's all he heard, and now there's a drought, and now in his heart of hearts, in his conscience, I believe Abram's starting to understand. I have brought Lot partly because I didn't know if I could trust this guy, Yahweh. Is he really going to protect me and my family? and my employees, my servants, my livestock, my future, is he really going to bless me? I've not really had any experience with him before. If I take Lot with me, he's got as many men with him, like probably 300. Abram had 318. He's got as many with him, and if a little does a little good, a lot will do a whole lot of good. So if I take Lot with me, I'm safer. Natural strength. Knows his nickels and numbers. Unfortunately, that's how we tend to think in the flesh. So he takes Lot, in a sense, for protection. Maybe provision. But when it says, now there was a famine in the land. That means the rain stopped. That means Abram has got 318 men. We don't know how many sheep and goats camels and donkeys that is but it's a bunch each one of them is going to be assigned to something like maybe 40 uh livestock times 318 it's it's a it's a bunch if if lots got that many it's a bunch and, and because of wild animals and because of raiders they've got to camp together at night and make camp and get all their livestock together and the more you got the more complicated that is but when the rain gets short and the grass gets short, you're going to have to move continually and you can't move fast enough to get the animals' bellies full. And when these shepherds go out, one of them goes north and one of them goes north by northwest and one of them goes northwest and one of them goes north west by north, et cetera, et cetera. When they go out, they've got to go further and further and further for their animals to get their bellies full. And you got over here with you're over here with donkeys, and this guy's over here with sheep, and they're both trying to, to graze, and they've got to go further and further, and they're overlapping each other. And now you've got twice as many because Lot's got his 300 guys and maybe 300 herds. You're talking about a city. And when the rain gets short, you are in a crisis. You're going to have shepherds fighting each other. You're going to have animals. They don't want to go back. You got to herd them back because they don't volunteer to come back. You got to herd them back to the central camp at night and their bellies aren't full. They don't want to come back. You got a problem. In other words, God is turning up the heat and it's getting real, real, real uncomfortable really, really fast by him cutting off the rain. Now, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. That means the rain cut off. And as he was about to enter the Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. This is the most embarrassing verses in the whole Bible. 
I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and then they will kill me and let you live. Say you're my sister so that I will be treated well. I will get paid for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you, protection and provision. The essence of embracing the cross is to trust God to protect and provide when it looks like he's not going to protect and provide, and he did not trust God to protect and provide he is going to sell out his wife. In his conscience, he knows he has messed up. He has brought Lot, and God has turned off the water and made Lot seem like an asset. But this big, fat, juicy potato that he brought with him has become a hot potato, and he can't hold on to it. He's, got, he's become a liability, but he's already brought him. What's he going to do? Send him back? So he's painted himself into a corner. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace, into his harem. He treated Abram well for her sake. That means money. And he, uh, Abram acquired sheep, cattle, male and female, donkeys, men, ser men servants, and maid servants, and camels. Y'all, this could have been the equivalent to us in their day of a million dollars. This was vast. One men servant, one man servant was a lot of value. Let alone these animals, donkeys were very, very valuable. Uh, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. Because of Abram's sin, they're suffering. Now they're a wicked people worshiping awful gods awful gods, but still they're suffering because of the sin of Abram. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, and he, he knew, he had enough sense to know, or his advisors knew, this is happening for a reason, and the reason is that woman that you've got in there in your bedroom. This didn't happen in 24 hours. This didn't happen in a few minutes they all were afflicted by serious diseases and Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Okay. Take her to be my wife. Not just, in, not just in that Hebrew right there. Although the Hebrew is pregnant with meaning. There's other places throughout the scripture that tells us that what happened here was extensive. When they got married, when Pharaoh married somebody, it wasn't that he went to the courthouse and, and got a blood test and asked for some paperwork and got a marriage license and stood in front of a preacher and, and wore, put on a black suit and a top hat and his bride had on a white gown that's not how they did it she became his wife when they slept together she became my wife why did you say she is my sister i took her to be my wife now then here is your wife take her and go then pharaoh gave orders about abram to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had pharaoh just wants to be well again no, it doesn't matter how much stuff you got. It don't matter if you own the whole planet. If you don't have your health, you do. You don't have anything. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev. That's the southern part of Canaan. With his wife, he's headed from Egypt is further south than than Canaan, and so he's heading up north, and he hits the southern part of Canaan with his wife and everything he had. And Lot went with him. Well, that's that phrase again. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. Yeah, when? When he was in, he got paid a lot. We're talking about like a million dollars, I think. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. And it doesn't say God said anything again. He calls on the name of the Lord up here, and God says, okay, I'm giving you the minimal thing. At least your offspring will get this place. 
And it doesn't say God said anything when he calls on the name of the Lord. Now, Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. You understand? Yeah. He's got a city with him. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot, and the Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. The problem they had before is even worse because now he's got, Abram has got even more livestock and people to support. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you or between your herdsmen and mine, for we're brothers. It's not the whole land before you. Let's part company. You go the left, and I'll go the right. You go the right, and I'll go the left. Okay, in other words, we can't camp together. It doesn't mean I won't still be your uncle. It doesn't mean you won't still be my nephew. It doesn't mean I don't love you or nothing like that. We just can't stay together because there's not enough grass in one place to support us. I'm a, I'm a full-time professional stockman. I do cattle for a living, okay? I think a little different than most of you hearing the sound of my voice, but this one time I happened to be right about this i know about short grass i know about cattle and what they do in time of the year etc 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 when the rain doesn't come lot looked up and he saw the whole plain of the jordan was well watered like the garden of the lord like the land of egypt towards zoar this was before the lord destroyed sodom and gomorrah so when god destroyed sodom and gomorrah within a few years after this it changed the whole ecology before the fire fell, before the, the, the uh, brimstone or sulfur fell, that was a very, very fruitful, fertile place, but it became a desolate place when the curse of God came on Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan, and he set out towards the east, and the two men parted company, and Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. And now here's a really important paragraph. Really, really important. Now heretofore, all God said to him that we have on record is to your offspring, I'll give this land. When he builds that first altar, he builds other altars, and he calls on the name of the Lord, and we don't have any record of God saying anything. But now, he doesn't even have to build an altar. He's dealt with his sin as best he could at this point. His sin in bringing Lot has called him to go to Abram and sin even more greatly by giving away his wife. But God in his sovereignty gets her back but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be consequences for the trip to Egypt and for bringing Lot. There will be consequences. But in the grace of God, because he's gotten rid of Lot, he's parted ways with Lot, all of a sudden it's like God is saying, yippee, 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 yes, 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 yes. Instead of just speaking eight words, you know, to your offspring I will give this land, this is what the Lord says. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east, well, excuse me, north and south and east and west. All the land that you see, I will give who? To you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust then your offspring could be counted, go. Walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I'm giving it to you. In other words, it's a completely different situation now that Lot is gone. And yet God never did say, I told you not to bring Lot. It's a different covenant. When they disobey in Exodus, there's a different kind of rebuke. He in Exodus 6, it says that in, with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he did not reveal himself as Yahweh, but only as El Shaddai. That's a heavy, heavy statement. That's an intense, intense statement.
he wasn't going to rebuke them. Abraham messes up, he gets rebuked. I mean, excuse me, Moses gets breasts up, he gets rebuked. Pharaoh messes up, he gets rebuked. Nadab and Abihu, Aaron messes up, they get rebuked. They get rebuked in the book of Exodus, but they don't get rebuked here. And that is God showing who he is in his love and free will. He is building a foundation here and taking his time and doing it the way that's perfect. He's in this also, he's in the sense he's writing the scripture with every footstep that Abraham takes, Abram takes, and Lot takes. He's writing the word of God. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Now, uh, I'm going to close here very quickly. This is some stuff that I've talked about before, but tonight I wanted to go back and relay this foundation and remind you of something. Okay, God doesn't rebuke him, but in the next chapter, it, there's a consequence of Lot being there in that Lot is down there with the evil people, and he gets carried off into to, uh, war. He gets kidnapped by uh, some four kings, and Abram has to go rescue him and bring him back. So there's still a consequence for there being Lot there. There's going to be a lot of consequences for Lot being there, but that's one of them. But in the next chapter, Abram is kind of like chapter 15. I don't see, where's the kids? Where's the kids? My wife's not having any babies. And the Lord says, don't worry, you're going to have kids, but know this. They're going to be enslaved and mistreated 400 years in a country not their own, which he's talking about Egypt. And that's him saying very loudly, there are consequences to your trip to Egypt and the time Sarah spent with Pharaoh. Huge consequences. For someone to tell you, if you've got family, that your children are going to be enslaved and mistreated for 10 years, let alone 400. That's the worst word ever. We don't need to just read right over that. Why did God, did God wake up on the wrong side of the bed? No. There's consequences. So the whole book of Exodus about coming out of Egypt after being there 400 years among the idols of Egypt, coming out with a tendency to want to worship a golden bull, is because of what happened in chapter 12. That definition, of them, then they try to get back into Canaan and they sin again because of what happened in Egypt, really. The last 30 years, I believe, caused them to sin greatly and added the 40 years in the desert. They were supposed to be in Egypt 400 years. They were there 430 years. It's a long story, but they wound up then spending 40 years in the desert. They were out of Canaan 470 years for pity's sake. If you go back in time with us, 470 years, goodness, you're talking about going back to Columbus. Anyway, I want to show you that, and I want to say this, this and I close, Ezekiel seems like a long way from Genesis. This is, I turned right to it. It's kind of scary. And you turn right to it. Uh, yeah, turn right to it. Genesis 23. I mean, Ezekiel 23, page 987 in the Most Holy Bible. 987. Genesis 23. I want to show you what Ezekiel is saying. He's 500 years after David. David was 1,000 years after Abraham. So we're talking 1,500 years after what Abraham did with Abraham, what happened with Abraham. And this is, I would not read you this chapter for a lot of money. This is the most X-rated chapter in the scripture. It's awful. But 
it describes what happened to Israel. And they divided into two countries. And they're pictured as two women. And it's calling them, calling them two women, but they're not two women. It's two nations that came from Abraham's offspring. And it's saying what they did in very lurid words. And it's saying it's because of what happened in Egypt in their youth when they learned prostitution. Okay? Prostitution is when somebody gets paid for sex. Prostitution is when somebody gets paid for sex. What does this chapter mean? The word of the Lord, verse 1, came to me, son of man. There are two women, daughters of the same mother. They became prostitutes in Egypt, engaging in prostitution from their youth. In that land, their breasts were fondled, and their virgin bosoms caressed, and the older was named Ahola, and her sister Ohalaba. And they were, they were mine and gave birth to sons and daughters. Ahola is Samaria, that's the northern kingdom, and Ahalaba is Jerusalem. Ahola engaged in prostitution while she was still mine, and she lusted after her lovers, the Assyrians, the warriors, clothed in blue, governors and commanders, all of them, handsome young men, mounted horsemen, and she gave herself as a prostitute to all the elite of the Assyrians and defiled herself and all her idols and everything she lusted after. She did not give up the prostitution she began in Egypt when during her youth, when during her youth, men slept with her. Okay. If it's not real women, if it's talking about countries, what is it talking about? It's talking about at the very beginning, the very, very youth of Israel was the days of Abram. When Abram got paid for her spending time in the bed of Pharaoh. That's when you get paid. It was the youth, and it had a consequence. It's not like God's mad. It's like in the spirit, in the spirit. There are real demons out there, and they have rights. And if we give lordship to them, they get to do things. To the third and fourth generation, they get more ability to tempt our offspring. They can't make them just like God refuses to make you do right. He wouldn't say, eh. To Abraham, you couldn't take Lot. But they can't force you to do wrong either. But they can tempt you more for three to four generations after you give in to it. And if, you, if they give in to it, then there's another three to four generations. And then again and again and again. And because of Israel giving in to those spirits that were loosed in the time of Abram, when in the youth of Israel, the very youth, the very beginning, Prostitution happened. Then they wound up going into these, these countries that are being named here or where they went into exile. And ultimately, it was because of what was sown all the way back there. That's what it's saying. That's what it's saying. The last verse of the previous chapter says, I looked for a man to stand in the gap, and I couldn't find one. He was looking for somebody to break the curse. And there wasn't one to be found. I want to be a curse breaker. I want to be a history maker. Because one thing, I'm equipped with the blood of Jesus. I'm equipped with the Spirit of God. I have Spirit of God living in me because the blood of Jesus is in me and it's cleansed me of my sin. So I have power more than they do, but I still have to fight these battles. I still have to overcome. I still have the capacity to hinder my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren by loosing things. Jesus said, Whatever you bind on heaven is bound. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. I don't want to loose anything bad. I don't want to loose these spirits, any generational spirits. This is all about generations, generations that get sad, depressed, whatever, and refuse to move. And then it goes to the next one. And it liked to pass, had to pass down again. But Abram repented, and yet there's still these consequences. <sighs> Father God, we love you, and we bless you, and we praise you, and we honor you, and we trust you. Help us to eat, drink, and sleep the word of God.
and listen for the Spirit of God at every moment, night and day. Help us to even be attuned to you as we sleep. In Jesus' name we pray. Be glorified in us through your spirit, by your word, in Jesus' name. Amen.